Um, I've worked with bats for about uh, 10 years. Um, I started off doing my undergraduate with some work up in the Yorkshire Dales and then studied a PhD uh, in and around Oxford looking at bats there and then did a couple of expeditions to Honduras and Gibraltar. Um, now I work at the Biological Record Centre, which is over in Wallingford, so just a stone's throw away. My talk has this title, Why Do Bats Get Fresher's Flu?, which is a bit cryptic. Um, for those who don't know, Fresher's Flu is uh, the, the flu that spreads around a university uh, soon after term starts, and the idea is that all your freshers come to university from across the country, they all have a little bit too much to drink, so their immune system gets suppressed, and they, they then start spreading all these diseases that they brought with them from home, and, uh, and then everyone gets the flu. Um, when I googled bats and freshers flu, this is the image I got, uh, a rather drunk-looking fresher in a Batman costume. But hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to answer this question, why don't bats get freshers flu? Uh, so I'm going to start by giving a general introduction to bats and their conservation. Hopefully you'll learn a thing or two about these flying creatures that are all around you. Um, and then I'm going to go on to talk a bit about my research, which was looking at the so I'm trying to understand how diseases spread through bat populations. So let's get some basic facts about bats. There are 1,200 or just over 1,200 species of bat. That accounts for one in every five mammal species. The only group which is larger is rodents. So they're incredibly species rich. So you find them on every continent except Antarctica. They also account for the largest concentration of mammals in any one place. That's in a place called Bracken Cave in Texas, and it has 20 million Mexican free-tailed bats in one cave. If you're ever over there, you can go and watch them fly out of an evening. It sounds pretty amazing. They also account for the largest migration of any mammal species in the Congo, uh, fruit bats migrating in time with the, with the fruit that they're eating. So why are there so many species of bats? Part of the reason is that they have evolved over a very long time period. So the first bats we see appearing in the fossil record are 52 million years ago. Now, almost certainly there were bats around a few million years before this, but this is the first fossil record that we have. So because they've been around for so long, it's given them time to evolve into all these different species. To put it into context, because 52 million years ago just is a big number. Um, that's around the same time that dogs were becoming dogs and cats were becoming cats. So quite a long time ago. So we've got all these bat species and, and there's a huge variation between them, a wonderful variation. The largest bat, the giant golden crowned flying fox, uh, is found in Egypt, has a wingspan of 5 foot 7 inches, which is pretty big. Uh, sadly, it's one inch wider than I am tall. Um, the smallest bat in the world is nicknamed the bumblebee bat. It's found in uh, uh, Thailand, Southeast Asia, and it weighs less than a 5p coin. And those guys live in caves and eat insects. There's also quite a bit of interest recently in putting monetary value on nature. We should care about it because it's valuable in a financial sense. Whether or not you agree with that, the study has been done looking at bats and whether we could put a value on bats. And some chaps in North America came up with the idea of valuing bats as pest control. So bats, a third of all bat species, eat insects. And many insects are pests of agriculture. So the idea was, if you hypothetically were to remove all bats from North America, how much extra money would you have to spend on pesticides to kill all the bugs that the bats are no longer eating? And they came up with this number, 15.1 billion pounds per year, which is a very large number. To put that in context, that is twice the budget of the London Olympic Games every year, or 1,200 times the annual budget of NASA every year, which is an amazing reflection on how valuable bats are and how poorly funded NASA is. So one of the interesting things about bats is their morphology, what they look like, their appearance. So my beautiful assistant here is a brown long-eared bat. You can tell because it's got long ears and they're brown. <laughs> Biologists aren't particularly imaginative. Um, so what's interesting about bats, well, there's many interesting things, but one of the interesting things is their wing. 
Uh, so a back's wing has the same bones in it as a human arm. So if I hold my arm out like this, this top bit here, that's the top of my arm, goes up the elbow, and then this next bit comes up here. There should be a joint here, like this. That's the wrist. So this bit, the good action at the back there, this bit here is the thumb. Okay. So when bats land on a surface, on a tree, in a cave, they'll use this to crawl around like a little hook. And if you ever see wildlife documentaries of vampire bats, they're incredibly good at running on the ground, and you'll see them using this thumb to run. The rest of the wing are their fingers. So the top two fingers are fused, and they go along the leading edge of the wing, the strong leading edge. And the other two fingers, if you imagine these, the rest of my fingers are sort of five feet long, they come down through the wing. And then stretched between all of those is the wing membrane. And that's what makes them fly. Now, the wing membrane uh, is also an interesting uh, story in evolution because there's a strong evolutionary pressure on a bat's wing to be able to heal quickly. The reason being, if you're a bat and you fly into a thorny bramble bush, which they do occasionally, and you damage your wing, uh, you won't be able to fly. And if you can't fly, you can't eat. And if you can't eat, you don't live. So there's a strong pressure from evolution for their wings to heal very quickly. And as a result, bats' wings do heal very quickly. I found bats before with scars running right from the top of their wing right down to the bottom, clearly showing that at some point it was in tatters. And it's actually the fastest healing tissue in the mammalian kingdom. So that's a bit about their morphology. Um, carrying on the theme of bats being incredibly diverse, they eat all sorts of things. In fact, if you name something, you can probably find a bat somewhere that eats it. So as I said, a third of bats eat insects, but there's also bats that drink nectar, bats that eat pollen, bats that eat frogs and fish and other bats and blood and birds and all sorts. So we're going to look here at just a few of them and how they're adapted to eat these things. So these are uh, nectar, nectivorous bats, nectar-drinking bats. Uh, and you'll see this guy has a long tongue, and that tongue is going to come all the way down this flower and get the nectar from the very bottom. This causes the bat a problem because the bat has quite a small head and a very large tongue, uh, and it's got to fit one inside the other. So what they do is they have a special cavity which goes around the brain, uh, and when the tongue's inside their mouth, it actually goes up, in, and around their skull. Their tongues also uh, evolved to be able to effectively suck up nectar. When the tongue comes in here, there's these hairs you might just see appearing on the side of the tongue here. What it does is when the tongue reaches the liquid, it pumps blood into the end of its tongue. That causes these little hairs to stand up on end, and it traps this sort of sticky nectar between them. So when it brings the tongue back out, it's got a good, it's got a good uh, volume of, of nectar there to gobble. That's the technical Bats in the UK, as I said, are all insectivorous. They all eat insects. Um, but they have different ways of doing this, different techniques, as it were. Um, this chap on the left is the brown long-eared bat, the same as my lovely assistant. And this other one here is a naturalist bat. And they have slightly different styles of hunting. The brown long-eared bat is a passive listener. It will sit and it will listen with its massive ears for the rustling wings of a moth. An atterous bat uses echolocation, which is a standard way most bats in the UK find their insects. And an atterous bat hunts in woodland. In fact, both of these species hunt in woodland. So here is our natterous bat, incredibly agile, so agile it can fly up to a spider's web, grab it with its feet, and then fly backwards without getting so much as tangled just a tiny bit. So bats are incredibly agile. They can turn on a, on a penny. And I've been out uh, watching bats at night before, stood opposite a friend of mine less than you know, two feet apart and had bats sort of flying straight in between us. They are absolutely incredible, which makes catching them in a net right, quite tricky. This is a brown long ear bat. So he's sitting here listening, listening out for the, for the moth. And when the moth comes by, he can home in, on, home in on it by using it. And brown long is actually a very effective at hovering. You saw there, it kind of held its position like a kestrel would. It has very broad wings, and that allows it to, to enter into this hovering flight. 
It then found the, the moth on the floor and gobbled it up. Uh, one of the side effects of having very large ears for the, for the brown long-eared, not only are they very cute, um, but they can also echolocate very quietly because they've got such good hearing. So we also nickname them the whispering bat because when you're out trying to hear them, you've hardly ever picked them up because they're so quiet. This bat here is going to feed on, uh, on nectar. Uh, unlike the ones with the long tongues uh, who would hover in front of the flower and drink the nectar, this guy just is landing on it and just lapping all up. And what this uh, is, why well, I put this in, is to show that it's a two-way street. Okay? The bats are benefiting from the flowers. They're drinking all this nectar, getting all the energy. But the flowers are benefiting from the bats because the bats are pollinating them. So this bat's crawling around all over this flower. It's getting pollen all over its face. And it's moving this pollen from one plant to another. So the, the, fl the flowers are giving up nectar, and then the bats are helping them out by pollinating them. And lastly, this is one of my favourite bats, the bulldog bat. This is catching fish. So it's got these huge feet, uh, much larger than uh, other bats of its size, and it uses echolocation to see the ripples on the surface of the water. And when it sees the ripples, because echolocation, it can't go into the water, so it can only just see the water's surface. When it sees the ripples, it just trawls through with these big feet and hopes that it will catch the fish that's there. And these guys are found in Central and Southern America. So... I've spoken there about bats as important as pollinators. Um, so it's a bit of a quiz. We're going to figure out uh, which one of these is not pollinated by a bat. But first of all, and chocolates are on offer, we're just going to name these five different things on the slide. Some of them are pretty easy, so you should get them all. Okay? You shout it out, and I'll just throw a sweet. I should say, these are chocolate. If you're allergic to chocolate, please don't eat them. <laughs> just say Tom. You, you have it. You have it. All right. Who can name one? Peach. 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 I'll give you that for peach. Okay, one at a time, people. One at a time. I think it's actually an apricot, but I think they'll look the same. Someone said coffee, which isn't right, but I'll give you it anyway. It's it's cocoa beans. You said cocoa, didn't you? Not me, but you said cocoa. There you go. Fig. Yep. Mango. Who said mango? Jesus. Right, I don't wanna. Don't want to kill anyone. Yeah, we had that already, but you can get one. All right, there's one. Who said that? Well done. You want to say it again? What's that one on the top right? Agave. And of course, you'll know what you use agave for. Do you know what you might use agave for, young man? No? Oh. Anyone know what you use agave for? Yes? As a sweetener. You might do. I know more for making tequila. <laughs> so yeah, agave is used for making tequila. Um, and bats pollinate it. Um, unfortunately, now when, when it's cultivated, they actually cut the flowers off before they flower, so the bats don't get to pollinate them. So I've given that one away, but which one of these isn't pollinated by a bat? Is that one Figs, yeah. Someone down here who said that. What's your yeah. God, terrible though. Yeah, figs are pollinated by wasps, but they are eaten by uh, bats. Bats will, will pick them up with their mouth, take them off the tree, and go and fly somewhere, and she need another one. <laughs> uh, and they'll go find someone and eat it, and they'll drop the seeds. So they're important as seed dispersers as well. All right, well done, guys. You know, I didn't think, I didn't think anyone would get agave. I'm very impressed with that. So, how do bats navigate? I've already mentioned echolocation a couple of times. And that's what you're hearing here. It's ultrasound, so it's above our audible hearing. Um, but this has been converted into the audible spectrum. You'll have heard there, there was a sequence of calls and then a sort of at the end. Uh, and that's called a feeding buzz. So the way echolocation works is they make sending out these pulses of sound which going out into the environment, bouncing off things, coming back to the bat's ears, and that's how it's seen. And you can think of it as, as if our world was pitch darkness and you had a strobe light. And this strobe light, you could turn it on, it was really bright, but it didn't pulse very much. So it's flashing. And when it flashes, you can see, but in between the flashes, you can't. So it's the same with the echolocation. When they're making these pulses, they can see. When they're not, they can't. If they're travelling across a field, 
they need it to be loud. Okay? And when it's loud, they can't do it very often. So, have these, so it's like our strobes, really bright, but very slow. So we can see across the field, but quite slow. When it comes to try and catch an insect that's right in front of its face, it doesn't need to be able to see very far, but it needs that to be much faster, so it can see the insect that's moving. So it's like turning your strobe up to be much faster, but dimmer. So that's why this call gets faster and faster as it approaches the insect, and then you get this sort of <laughs> noise, and that's just when the echolocation pulses are just really, really close to one another. We can't really tell them apart. So it's a few things that threaten bats. Um, and the top one is habitat loss. And that's the same for most wildlife. The, the main threat for most wildlife is habitat loss. We come into to their world and we change the landscape. We perhaps remove forests for, for pasture, for agriculture. Or we turn green spaces into urban, urban spaces. Um, one of the things that, is, that bats in the UK are particularly susceptible to is loss of roosting habitat. So bats who have typically roosted predominantly in big old trees with sort of rotting branches which have little nooks and crannies and peeling bark that they can roost in. And these aren't the sorts of trees that we keep in our landscape anymore um, because they're a health and safety hazard or because you could grow four young healthy trees where you've got one big old dying one. So that's, that's a real problem. And as a consequence, bats in the UK are much more reliant on human dwelling spaces, so they might come and live in your attic um, or in bridges or caves and that sort of thing. Um, as a result, all bats in the UK are protected by law. Um, another threat for bats is persecution. Um, so particularly in Australia, they have a problem with large aggregations of fruit bats, which make a real racket and smell. And people don't want them in their backyard. Uh, so they, sort of, they, they can scare them away and, and move them on to other places. So that's an issue for bats in some, in some parts of the world. And also, there's this interesting disease called white nose syndrome, which some of you might have heard of because it's been around for a few years now, and it sort of occasionally comes into the news. Um, it's actually causing the biggest die-off uh, in mammals in recorded human history. Um, it's a fungus. Uh, the story goes that the caver uh, went caving in some European cave and then flew back to the States and went caving in a cave in New York State. And they brought with them a fungus called Geomyces destructans. It was given that name afterwards. It would have been kind of very good foresight to realise what was going to happen. Um, and this fungus grows on bats when they're hibernating in winter. The bats wake up from hibernation because they've got this fungus going on them, and they clean it off. Now, because they've woken up from hibernation, they've used quite a lot of energy to do that. So they need to go out and replenish their, uh, their fat reserves. So they go out of the cave to feed, but there's no insects because it's the middle of winter. Um, and as a result, they starve. And in some cases, we're seeing 100% uh, fatality in caves, we're talking tens of millions of bats dying, you know, species which were previously common becoming uh, rare and endangered. So this is a, a real concern. There's not really much we can do about it. There's a lot of research going on into it. But there's not much we can do, really. Um, they tried to restrict cavers' access uh, to caves to try and stop the spread, but it seems that bats just move it from one cave to another anyway. Um, about a month ago, there was the first record of this fungus in a cave or on a bat uh, on the west coast. So that's, uh, that's particularly worrying, because now it's probably going to spread down, down the west coast of the States as well. And why are bats important? Why should we be worried if bats are, are in decline? Um, well, I've touched on a couple of these things before. Um, they're important as pest control, and we talked about those guys in the States who tried to put a price tag on them. They're important for pollination and seed dispersal, and we talked about them as you know, dispersing figs and pollinating plants. They're important as food in some parts of the world, so particularly in the tropics, uh, in Central Africa and in Indonesia, um, they're a bit of a delicacy. You can pick up a bat from a food market for uh, between a dollar and ten dollars. Ten dollars is a really big one. Um, and that's, that's okay if you're not over-harvesting the bats. But the problem is we don't really know how many bats is too many bats to take. Um, but certainly they're an important food source in, in some parts of the world. They're also valuable just culturally. Um, you, know, you guys are here because you think bats are interesting. And they are interesting, and, and, and people have thought that for many generations. And so they appear in, in literature, in, in witches' potions, or Batman comics, you know, or Aztec gods. And there's something mysterious about them, because they come out at night, and, and you only see them rarely, and they're drawn to firelight, and what's this? So, so they form a rich part of our culture. Um, one interesting example of this is this bridge. Um, this bridge is in 
uh, Austin, Texas. It's called Congress Avenue Bridge. And when it was built, the engineers put two slots that run the entire length of the bridge underneath, um, a few inches across and a couple of feet deep, and they're, ex they're expansion slots. So when the bridge gets hot in the hot Texas summer and the concrete expands, the bridge doesn't break. Um, the bats thought it made quite a good roost, so half a million bats moved in. And uh, the local council were sort of like, uh, is this a good thing? Bats, don't bats have rabies? Isn't this a sort of public health risk? So they were, they were going to uh, eradicate, uh, move them out of the bridge. But the local community thought that they were, you know, kind of interesting and you know, we, should, we should keep them. They add something to, to, to Austin. Uh, now there's a, a thriving tourist trade with people coming to look at these bats. They come every night and they stand on the bridge or they get on boats and go up and down the river. There's even a goth music festival every year, Bat Fest, uh, which takes place on the bridge. Uh, and all in all, this brings in uh, $3 million a year in income. Um, so bats are definitely really important culturally as well. So my PhD um, originated from um, a few different events that occurred in the sort of five years before my, before my PhD. And they were all to do with diseases in bats. So there was a couple of disease outbreaks which you probably wouldn't have heard of, but they're called Nipah and Hendra viruses, and they occurred in Australia and Indonesia. One of them resulted in the entire pig herd of Indonesia being eradicated. Um, and what happened in these cases was there was, there was a disease in bats, and these bats passed the disease to some domestic animals. These domestic animals got really sick and they infected the humans who looked after them. Uh, and they caused quite a few human uh, fatalities. So people became really interested in bats and disease. Um, and people always associate bats with disease anyway. Bats are seen as you know, dirty animals that you need to be worried about. And that, that really originates from rabies. So uh, some bats carry rabies, some bats in the UK carry rabies. And rabies is a very fatal uh, disease. It's pretty much 100% fatal one. To prevent these diseases is to stop this little bit here. To summarise, you could watch this film, Contagion, uh, which has a great cast and was written by an epidemiologist, someone who studies diseases, and he worked at the Centre for Disease Control, and he based this film on the Nipah virus outbreak. Uh, it's got some, actually some pretty good science. They even show a valid equation to do with how diseases spread, so I strongly recommend it. So, I wanted to understand how diseases would spread in bats in the UK, from a sort of academic standpoint. And the way I did this was to use something called social networks analysis. Now, you'll all have heard the phrase social networks, so you'll, you'll be thinking of Facebook and Twitter, really great tools for procrastinating efficiently. Um, they are tools for uh, connecting people to one another. A social network from, from a sort of scientific point of view, is an analysis of interactions between individuals within a population. Okay. And I'm going to take you through a few examples so you get a handle on what I'm talking about. When we present a social network, it looks something like this. We have nodes, those are the, the, the dots, effectively, and edges, or the lines that connect them. The nodes represent individuals, okay? people, animals, and we colour them according to some attribute that this individual has. So that could be gender or age or something like that. The lines connect individuals that interact in some way. And this can be defined differently for a different analysis. So it might be physical contact, or it might be people who've sent letters to each other, or what have you. So in this case, we've got blue and pink nodes. Can anyone guess what those might represent? And they are very stereotypical. At the back there. Is it blue for boys and girls? Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you got that, but I'm also annoyed that you're right at the back. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we've got blues for boys and pinks for girls. And this is a network of romantic relationships between children in a high school. Okay. So from this network, we can begin to learn things um, about the individuals. So we know, we can see from here that boys tend to go out with girls and girls tend to go out with boys. And we can also see that this guy has too many girlfriends. <laughs> so 
Network theory, the idea behind these, these networks, actually originated in maths and physics and was used to look at mass transport systems and how, how people move around them. Um, it was then taken up by anthropologists, and one of the communities who really saw value in it was the intelligence communities, because they could look at networks of people and work out who were the important players. So this is a network uh, created by uh, the intelligence communities of people involved in the September 11th hijackings. So the individuals with the at symbols and the numbers, they are the hijackers and the number is the flight that they were on. And you can imagine if you were an intelligence operative, um, you might look at this and you were trying to figure out whose phone you were going to tap. You might tap this guy here because he's connected to lots of different people. Or you might tap this guy here because he's not connected to as many people, but he bridges the network. So quite a lot of information might flow through that person. So we can start to learn more about individuals from looking at this sort of whole uh, social network. This is the Exeter University Freshers Facebook page. <laughs> this is all the Facebook users that are uh, assigned to this page, and they're connected to all the other users that they are friends with on Facebook. The take-home message here is that they are incredibly interconnected. Okay? And it's part of the reason that Freshers flu spread so quickly. They spread you know, because they're so interconnected. The, the dots here, or nodes, are also scaled. They're, you see that some are larger than others. They're scaled by how many friends they have. Okay? So this one here has loads of friends. Um, I was curious as to who this was, and I looked it up. It's actually a bar. <laughs> Another thing I've done here is I've applied a computer algorithm to the network and asked it to identify social groups. So trying to identify groups of individuals who are more tightly connected to one another than others in the network. So it's quite clear to us, just looking at eyeballing it, that this is a, a social group here. But perhaps less so that there's four social groups here. And I'm going to apply the same method uh, to this next network, which is my Facebook, my Facebook friends. So these are all the friends who I am, or people I am friends with on Facebook. That doesn't necessarily mean they're all my friends, of course. Um, and they're connected to one another if they're friends with each other. So uh, we've got an ex-girlfriend here, and she is friends with my brother, so they're connected by a line. They're also scaled differently. So they're scaled here in how valuable they are for linking the network as a whole. So for example, we've got Chris over here. He's a very large node. He's a very large node because he connects all these blue people to these people over here and these people over here. And we call this measure betweenness. So betweenness is how important you are at connecting a group. That contrasts to your degree centrality, which is how many friends you have or how many people you're connected to. I've applied that same algorithm again to separate this out into social groups or cliques. And you can quite clearly see there's this one here, but there's also my friends from home, my university friends, people I went on holiday with. Um, actually, there's a small group of bat researchers uh, and so on. So this is, this is quite accurate. It's pretty good. Um, you might also be aware of a TV show called Meerkat Manor. Uh, Meerkat Manor is a, a TV show where they, they follow the trials and tribulations of... Um, some, some meerkats who are treated quite a lot like human beings, uh, full of emotion and, and terror. Um, and these meerkats are actually part of a Cambridge University study uh, looking at social structure of the population. Uh, and I've really put up these three graphs just to show you that you can create a network from different sorts of behavior. So here, this graph is just interested in dominance behavior. So when one meerkat sort of had a go at another, that would be a connection on this network. And these become directed, OK, because that dominance behavior goes from this one over that one. So you can get these complicated sort of networks, which take, this, take these ideas a bit further, sort of grooming there and, and foraging competition. So how would we use such a network uh, to monitor diseases? I have a beautiful assistant at the back um, who is now going to throw, upon my command, a giant beach ball into the audience. And we're going to use this to select patient zero. Because this beach ball, unbeknownst to you, is uh, contaminated with weaponized smallpox virus. <laughs> okay. So please release the ball and just toss it around each other in the audience. 
Try not to. <laughs> Try not to hurt anyone. Okay, and stop. Keep a hold of it. I think it was this girl here in the middle who got infected with, uh, with smallpox virus. You haven't got long to live, so I'll give you some chocolates just to <laughs> tide you over. What's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca, okay. So Rebecca's got smallpox. So what we need to do... Oh, wait, wait. There's a symbol for Rebecca. There we go. <laughs> Unhappy face. Patient zero. So what we need to do is we need to track down your social network because we need to find out who's been in contact with these cakes. We need to make sure that they're, they're not going to get the disease too. So what I want you to do... Uh, Rebecca, can you just put up your hand so everyone can see where you are? If anyone here has come, let's say, within a metre or two uh, in the last, say, 24 hours, so if you were stood in the queue outside together, perhaps at the, uh, sat at a table earlier waiting, or if you're sat in her proximity where she is right now, I want you to put up your hand now. Oh, dear. This is spreading. Keep your hands up, by the way. This is spreading quickly. So you are the first-degree contacts. Okay? You are one degree of separation away from patient zero. But we don't just have to worry about you. We also have to worry about the secondary contacts. So everyone who hasn't got their hand up, I want you to look at everyone who has got their hand up, and you're going to apply that same principle. Okay? So if you come in contact with any of these people, put your hand up now. Oh, yeah. Sorry. The guys who handed out the voting pads got sick, so you're all gone. That's it. All right. See you, guys. So you can see that the value of understanding it, of knowing a social network, and how it's important for seeing how disease spreads through a community. So I wanted to apply this theory to bats uh, in Whiten Wood. So Whiten Wood is a lovely bit of woodland. I highly, highly recommend going along if you haven't been before. It's just outside Oxford. So this is the Oxford Ring Road here, Oxford over here. It's far more reservoir, and then the River Thames runs over the top like this. Lovely bit of woodland owned by Oxford University. Um, and they do a lot of uh, research there into birds. And thankfully, they've installed 1,200 bird boxes, which are all these yellow dots, which is where my bats live. So, my bat boxes look a bit like this. Um, obviously, they're not bat boxes, they're bird boxes, so they've got this sort of bird hole on the front. And what I would do is I would go around the wood, I would open up one of these boxes, and I'd hopefully find bats inside. And when I did, I'd take them out and I'd weigh them and sex them and age them, see if they had any parasites on them, and I'd put a little aluminium armband on them. And one of these bats that's about to come out has one on. You see just here. So this armband doesn't cause them any problems. It just sits on the top of their arm, and it has a letter and four numbers on it. And they uniquely identify that bat. So it means that when I come back next time, I know which bat is which. And so to create my social network, what I did was I said, any bats that roost together... So any bats I found in the same box, they were connected by a line in my network. So that's how I said they were connected. So they came into close physical contact. They could have spread a disease if they wanted to. So Natura's bats, that's the one we saw eating the spider out of the web. They were one of the species I looked at. And this was a real eureka moment. I'd been doing this work for three years, three summers. I had all this data in a table. And there was no way of knowing what the social network was going to look like until it went through this algorithm. You can't eyeball it like you can some data. You can't just fling up a quick graph and have a look. You have to wait. Wait for these, this, this algorithm to run. It took a couple of hours, and then this popped out, and I was so excited because I can write a thesis about this. This looks great. We've got clear social groups. Okay? We don't need a computer algorithm to put colors on this. We could have done that ourselves. These lovely, clear social groups. The social groups include both males and females in them. There's a lot of uh, interactions within the social groups, but between them, not very much. Fantastic. Um, if I'd run the Dor Benton's bats first, I think I would have been a bit disappointed because it's not very clear what's going on. There's this red group at the bottom. Um, they're actually geographically isolated from the other lot. So Dor Benton's bats forage over water, and you'll have remembered I had far more down one end of the map and had the River Thames at the other. So these bats are sort of split across the woodland. And these red ones are down by Farmer Reservoir. So this confused me a bit, because I know that Dor Benton's bats are social. So what I did was I separated the males and females and ran the analysis again. And what you see now is that the females have a social structure, but it was being camouflaged in here by the males, which don't really have a strong social structure. And in fact, what's happening is these females are very uh, 
uh, faithful to their social groups. They just hang out with their, with their group of friends. But the males move from one to another. Okay, they move between. And what implication this has for disease is that a disease would spread quite quickly within a female group, but wouldn't spread quickly between them. However, because males are unfaithful to groups, males move between them, males could act as a sort of disease bridge, carrying the disease from one female group to another. The next question I can ask with the same data set is where are the social groups? So here's Whiteham, here's uh, Oxford just off to the side. All these red dots are boxes that I found Natura's bats in. Okay, so they're the first, that's the first network we looked at, the one that looked really nice. Where are the social groups? If we looked at just one of those social groups, where, where are they roosting? Now, you could, you could hypothesize two things. You could hypothesize that one of those social groups uses the entire of the wood. So if you just took one of those colored social groups, you could say, well, actually, I think I'll find them anywhere in the wood. And all of these social groups just use any of the boxes. They just all move around each other in the woodland. They don't roost together, but they roost in all the boxes just milling about. And that, that would be valid, because there's lots of roosts in the wood. The bats aren't really competing over roosting space. And as I said, there's 1,200 boxes. Um, so that, that could be true. And the other one was that um, social groups would have their own territories, their own patches. Now that might be the case if they were defending a sort of foraging resource, if they wanted to keep this bit of the wood for themselves because it's, you know, it's got loads of moths in it or something. So we plotted it out on the map, and this is what we got. So the second hypothesis was true. The social groups all had their own territories, their own patches of wood that they called their own. And these are the Natura's bats. Um, there's a bit of overlap here. This is just because one bat just kind of went on a jolly, and one of the purple bats just went on a jolly into the, into the orange's territory on his own. So it makes it look like they overlap quite a lot, but it was actually just, just one bat. Uh, the Dorbentons females were kind of, kind of the same. You see how they, they hug the, the edge of the wood nearest to the river there, and down here near Farmall. Um, you'll also see there's some asterisks uh, here. These are um, from radio tracking. So some of the bats, we put tiny little transmitters on, which would send out beeps, which I could pick up with a big sort of TV antenna, and that allowed me to home in and find these bats from day to day. And that was really just to validate our results. We wanted to check that the results we were getting just from going around and checking the boxes was, was true. So we tracked some of these bats individually every day to see if they were staying in their areas. And uh, for the most part, they did, except for this, this one here. So why is, what, what does this tell us? Why is this finding important? Well, we know that bats have, that social groups have distinct home ranges, which we didn't know. But also, we now know that they use quite small areas of woodland. I mean, these, these are not large areas. This is sort of, what, 400 metres, 500 metres across? That's a small area of woodland. If you'd asked me before these results came out how big an area a social group would have used, I would have said it would be more like a quarter of the woodland. So it's really quite small, and that means that if we're going to be doing habitat management, if we're going to be clearing out some woodland for timber or, or habitat restoration, we need to think a bit, bit more carefully about the bats and how it's going to impact on bats and their, and their social groups. So that was my PhD, and I'm now going to talk just for a little bit about some of the things I've been doing since then. Um, one of the things I'm interested in is gadgets, uh, and somehow I've managed to wangle that into my job. Um, so one of the gadgets that you get to play with with bats is a bat detector. Now, I said earlier that bats use ultrasound, and we can't hear that. That's not strictly true. Some young people who maybe haven't been to too many Ozzy Osbourne concerts uh, can probably still hear bats. Um, when, they, when bats are using the lowest part of the spectrum. But for the rest of us, we have these bat detectors. And a bat detector um, allows you to... Uh, it, it hears ultrasound and converts it to audible sound. So what I need now is someone at the back who has a big set of keys. And people are always reluctant at this stage to get out their keys. Like they're, they're fearful I'm going to come and snatch them off them. I'm, I'm not going to. So anyone at the back has got a set of keys. I want you to take it out of your pocket, and I want you to jangle it loudly. Thank you very much. So jangling metal creates a lot of... You can come and get some chocolates later. Um, jangling metal creates a lot of ultrasound. There's actually quite a few things when you start wandering around the landscape at night that make, that make ultrasound. Crickets, some crickets and grasshoppers make ultra, ultrasound. Electric fences make ultrasound. It's a kind of ticking noise. Rushing water makes quite a lot of ultrasound. So we use these devices to listen into bats. 
Uh, and you can get a variety of different sorts. You can get very expensive ones, which experts would use, like this, which might cost £2,000. Uh, this, this is the same one I was holding there, you can get for about £80. Um, and then we've also got this new sort of wave of bat detectors, which are really lightweight uh, and, um, and quite cheap, actually, quite reasonable. So I got to thinking about uh, these bat detectors. And one of the things we do when we use them is we, uh, with the expensive ones, you can record the sound onto sort of a memory card. And then you go back to the office and you, you plug that memory card into your computer and you visualize it on a graph. And that allows you to identify some of the bat species which are harder to hear the difference between in the field. The problem with that is you can't do it in the field. You've got to go back to your, to your, la to your laptop or your computer. Now, there are some really snazzy sort of iPad type things which will, which will do it, but they cost quite a few hundred pounds. What I was frustrated by was that I carry around this computer in my pocket. Uh, it's called a smartphone. Uh, so why can't I just plug my bat detector into a smartphone, you know? They are really computers disguised as phones, um, and everyone has them. So it actually turns out if you go to Maplin's and you chat to the guy behind the counter for long enough, he'll work out how you can connect the two together. So for 20 quid, I got a few cables, and I was able to visualize uh, back calls from my bat sector on my phone using a free app. And there's a lot, of, lot going on at the moment in wildlife conservation, thinking about how we can piggyback on these really successful commercial technologies, like new web designs and, and smartphones and these sorts of things. Um, and look at how we can use them to understand more about wildlife and how you guys, members of the public, can use them to help us understand more about wildlife. So, for example, where I work at the Bi Biological Records Centre, we've developed quite a few different smartphone apps for recording ladybirds and butterflies and dragonflies and those sorts of things. So if you're going out for walks, you can use these things to submit your sightings. And we use that to understand how wildlife is changing and to the data that, that we get through those sorts of things. actually really valuable. Another thing I was interested in uh, was drones. I mean, who isn't? They're pretty cool. Um, and somehow I managed to convince my, convince my work to buy me one. Uh, so there's a, there's a drone there. Um, I got chatting to a friend of mine at a wedding, and he was really into, into drones. And after a few pints, it sounded like a really great idea to strap a bat detector to a drone and just fly it around the landscape. And then we'd learn loads about bats that were there. We could cover a really large area really quickly. We could survey at height. We could go to dangerous places over lakes and these sorts of things. So um, we've, tried, we've tried to do this with, with varying success. Um, let me just get this going. Uh, this is me launching a drone. So what we've done is we've taken that really lightweight bat detector that was on the far right of my first slide and strapped it to the side of these, these planes these are just standard remote control planes that you buy from the hobby shop. Um, they're really clever these days. You can set waypoints and they'll fly between these waypoints, take off and land completely autonomously. Um, really very impressive. We can use this technology to help increase our understanding of wildlife. Now, obviously, there's lots of uh, legal issues with drones, using drones in the UK. They're very tightly regulated. But elsewhere in the world, drones have been used for um, monitoring poaching, so patrolling up and down border fences to see if there's poaching going on. Um, they've been used to survey orangutans. So orangutans build nests, which is phenomenal in and of itself. They build nests in the top of trees, so surveying them from the ground in the forest is actually quite tricky. But if you send a drone over the top taking pictures, you can, you can survey them quite easily. So there's a lot of work going into how you can use drones, which is fantastic because I get to play with drones. So what if you want to do, if, you, if I've inspired you, hopefully today you're interested in bats, what do you do next? How do you find out more? How do you go out and see them? Well, I highly recommend getting in touch with your local bat group. There's two really good ones local to here, um, the Oxfordshire and the uh, Barks and South Bucks bat group. Uh, they're both fairly active, and you can go out with them on days out and look at bats in bat boxes or go on nighttime bat walks. Um, so they're great, and there's going to be there's a bat group in every every county in the UK. So if you're from further afield, you can look up yours. Um, one of the easiest things to do might be to get a bat detector. Unfortunately, they're, they're like I said, they are about eighty pounds, so not that cheap, just because they're quite a specialist bit of gear. gear. But um, it doesn't take too much uh, time to learn how to use one, and you'll be able to identify you know three or four common UK bat species to go out and impress your friends. Particularly good when combined with um, an armchair and a gin and tonic in the garden, I'd highly recommend. <laughs> About gin and tonic o'clock, that's when the bats come out. Um, if you get into that as well, you can get involved in national, there are national surveys where members of the public go out and, and record bats, and that helps to inform our understanding of how bats are doing and where their populations are going up and down. Another thing that a lot of us can do is to 
create a bat-friendly garden. So bats eat insects. So any, any planting that you do, flowering plants, which are going to encourage insects, and moths and butterflies, those sorts of things, they're great for bats because they provide food for them. Um, also, another thing you can do is put up bat boxes. So kind of like a bird box, except instead of having a hole in the front, they've got a sort of slot underneath, which bats go up in, into. And they can be really great too for providing habitat. So there's quite a few things that we can do to help bats uh, and to go and explore bats. They're all out there in the landscape. They're all around us. But a lot of us uh, go about our lives without really seeing them. So that leaves uh, one question outstanding, which is why don't bats get freshers flu? Can you tell me why bats don't get, wouldn't get freshers flu? Or more specifically, why they wouldn't get a disease like freshers flu? Yes? Bingo. Okay, so they're not highly connected. Um, so the disease wouldn't, the disease would spread very quickly within one of the social groups, but it would burn out. So people get immune to Fresh's flu. Oh, stolen. <laughs> so Fresh's, a flu burns quite quickly. Uh, and by that I mean you get it, you get sick, you're infectious for a few days, you get over it. Um, so within the community of bats, you know, these guys would all get it, all get sickly, but then the virus would die out because they'd all become immune before they had a chance to spread it to the next group. So excellent. So that just leads me to say a few thank yous to people who've helped me throughout my research and with the sort of drone stuff, uh, some people who took some photos, and I'm more than happy to take questions. And if you don't have time for a question in this, in this time period afterwards, feel free to come down and chat to me. I can talk to you about bat detectors. You can look at my drone. I've got some books here about bats. And there's a lot of chocolate still to be eaten. So <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. That was a fantastic talk, and I hope you all agree. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Oh, God, right. You're going to get some exercise. I'll throw the microphone. <coughs> uh, what got you into studying bats? Like, it's a very specialist field, so... Yeah. Um, so, when I was doing my undergraduate at Durham, I did a year in industry, so you take a break from your studies to go and work. And I worked with DEFRA up in York. And um, while I was up there, there was a, a, a study going on to see how many bats in the UK had rabies, because the government was quite concerned that it might be a, a health risk. So I got involved in that. And once you start studying bats, there's just no going back, really. They are truly charismatic creatures. They, you know, they fly at night, they echolocate, they're bats that drink blood, they have these amazing wings. That, you know, they're just phenomenal, fascinating creatures. So that kind of got me hooked, really. Yeah. And when I came to finish my undergraduate, I wanted to do a PhD, and I had experience with bats, so it was just a natural progression, really. Any more questions? Thinking about the use of drones, mm. wouldn't the propeller blades approach sort of supersonic and ultrasonic sounds and disrupt the bat's echolocation? So there is ultrasound produced by the drone, and in fact, that's one of the biggest problems we have at the moment is interference noise generated by the drone. But it's n nowhere near loud enough to be a problem for a bat. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think if there are... I mean, bats' echolocation is incredibly loud. We're talking sort of, you know, pneumatic drill-type volumes just at a, in, a, in a pitch that we can't hear. Um, and there's really not much out there in the human landscape which generates ultrasound at those sorts of frequencies, at a volume that would um, mess with bats ultrasound. Any more questions? There's one behind you. Oh. <laughs> and do social networks remain the same, both for mm. um, hibernation and also when the bats are giving birth? So um, we were just looking at the bats in summer. So the social networks I was presenting were the summer social groups over a number of years. So those social groups were maintained from one year to the next. That's interesting because um, people have assumed that being able to maintain social groups over such a long period requires quite a lot of intelligence. So we're thinking about elephants and whales and, and primates, which, which have quite large brains. So it's quite impressive that bats can do that. Um, more so impressive because they don't have the same, uh, they don't roost for the same social group in hibernation. Either. So they, they travel great distances to hibernation sites. Um, 
So yeah, I hope that answers your question. So these are just look at the summer ones and the winter ones are a bit different. Okay. We think. Hi. Um, how do bats make the ultrasound? So they make the ultrasound uh, from their vocal cords. Um, I'm not sure specifically what it is about the physiology that allows them to make such uh, high-pitched noises. I guess it's just structured in a, in, a, in a different way to ours. Interestingly, some bats in the UK echolocate out of their mouth. Um, in fact, all, all the bats I showed you, um, all the pictures I showed you were bats that echolocate out of their mouth, but there's also the horseshoe bats, the greater and lesser horseshoe bats. They're bats which uh, hang upside down and do this sort of uh, Count Dracula one. They have a nose leaf, they have this bit of skin on their nose, and you might have seen it in, uh, on other bats, sort of ugly looking bats from the tropics and, this. and they echolocate out of their nose and that allows them to echolocate and hold a food item in their mouth at the same time and also gives them a little bit more uh, directionality they can sort of focus the beam and things as well hi uh, we get bats around our house in summer um, what would their range be how far might they have flown so the range that a bat will fly on a night um, is quite species dependent. It's also quite dependent on individuals. Different individuals will fly different distances. So the brown long ears bats, they don't stray more than about 400 meters from their roost. And they'll fly around. Typically, uh, bats, individual bats will fly the same route every night. They sort of get to know their, their route. But other individuals from the same social group or same colony might go a different route. Um, but also um, pipistrelles, um, there's two soprano and common pipistrel, which are the commonest bats in the UK, which you might have seen around your house. Um, there's been some work done by a PhD student in Norwich over the last few years looking at how far they go, and some of them fly up to 15 kilometres um, away from their roost every night. Um, so it really varies, but I'd say 15 kilometres is a long way. We would normally expect maybe five kilometres as a maximum, as a rule of thumb, I guess. Good evening. Can you tell us why uh, bats are predominantly evening or night flyers only? So bats in the UK are all feeding on insects and there's a greater abundance of insects typically at dawn and dusk. There are also, um, you know, bats can fly at night That's or in, in dark conditions, that's their advantage. So they are sort of separated from birds in that respect. So birds may be eating, eating insects during the day and bats are filling that niche that occurs at night time. Um, although it's worth noticing that fruit bats do the same in the tropics. Fruit bats are, are more active at dusk. Um, and putting me on the spot, I couldn't say why necessarily they would go out at dusk and not earlier. Um, you could say, well, maybe they're avoiding predation because birds can predate on, on bats, like owls can predate on bats. So they would be more advantageous coming out at night. But we know that predation rates by birds on bats is actually very low. Um, uh, I, I did once have an experience of uh, trying to extract a bat out of a, mist, uh, a net which used for catching bats. Uh, and I was in the middle of a river up to my hips in water and an owl flew into the other side of the net to try and catch uh, the bat that was in my hand, the whole net fell over and I was stranded in the middle of the river with a net in my head. Um, but yeah, that's sort of a roundabout way of answering as much of your question as I could. Did yes. bats first have wings? When did bats first have wings? Um, did, them, did they have wings like in the Jurassic period? Ah, kind okay. Of thing? Yeah, so, so that fossil I showed you was... Um, was the earliest fossil of a, of a bat, and he has wings. Uh, but one of the reasons they think that we don't have more bats in the fossil record is because um, their, their bones are so fragile, um, they get damaged very easily, and the wing membrane is so thin it breaks up very rapidly. So having wings might be part of the reason that actually we don't see many fossils of them. But yeah, we think that they, they flew uh, first, and then they developed echolocation after that. Fantastic. Um, if you, anyone else has any more questions, please do come down and speak to Tom at the end. We're just going to run through some of our new evaluation questions. Um, so we'll have another round of applause for Tom. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic.